Okay. Uh, my main interest is archery, actually, historical or traditional archery. And I have been interested in archery for almost 15 years. And uh, I am one of the pioneers of the movement of revival of traditional archery in modern Turkey because the tradition died somehow and we had to uh, recover all the uh, information from the written sources and we had to uh, check and confirm them on field. So hunting was a part of this uh, attempt. So uh, I'm a dentist, so I had, have a PhD on periodontics, so nothing to do with history directly in, on an academic level. But uh, somehow uh, I had such a destiny, such a some, something uh, my interests actually guided me to where I am now. So uh, the, the the history of archery is or cannot be separated from uh, the history of hunting. So that's why I am here actually to talk about the uh, hunting culture uh, of Turks and the Ottomans. This is my third time in Eger and uh, this is my second time to give an interview to a local uh, uh, channel is that a channel I don't know um, I've been here for archery competitions before uh, again organized in the Agar Castle Museum and uh, I enjoyed it a lot I have quite uh, uh, a lot of friends from Hungary both Agar and from other side so I uh, really like Agar I mean in terms of the uh, cultural traces we can find from the Ottoman time including the minaret here and in general I, f I think that there are um, uh, remarkable similarities between people, I mean between Hungarian and Turkish people. So it's my third time and I hope I will be able to come here again. Well, uh, as I said, in terms of uh, the, the cultural remains, uh, it is remar remarkable. And uh, in terms of the wine culture, it is remarkable also. Last, in my last visit, for example, we have been able to participate in a wine festival. It was just a coincidence that it was held just after the competition. So we stayed uh, a day uh, to enjoy uh, that cultural part of the city. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be here in your lovely country. Uh, this, is, this, this lecture will be about the hunting culture of the Ottoman Empire, uh, which will focus on 16th and 17th centuries, but uh, there will be, uh, uh, th there are roots actually behind it. So it, is, uh, it can be tracked back to Central Asia, where uh, the uh, the alliances were uh, classified as Kaganites or uh, states afterwards, after centuries, but at that time they were just alliances, so that's why it was not very easy to tell them apart uh, by following their ethnic origins or their languages, but uh, there was a common culture, uh, which is also similar in Hungarian, uh, early Hungarian culture, as you know, and there were warlords, and the other warlords uh, uh, formed some alliances with the others, and they they were uh, classified a, as Kaganates, for example, uh, like for example Arpad, who brought seven tribes to Carpathian Basin in ninth century. So uh, that's why it is not uh, that that's why it is not very easy actually to find good evidence. Uh, the uh, written sources are uh, rare. Uh, Byzantine, Persian, and uh, Chinese sources uh, are the only sources that we can use. No Turkic sources except some uh, inscriptions on rocks in Orhun and uh, Yenisei. Uh, but they are uh, eight from 8th century or so because the Turks appeared under the name of Turk uh, in 5th, 6th century. So we re really don't have any idea or solid uh, evidence uh, about uh, the ethnicity, about the uh, the culture behind, but uh, this is a very popular depiction here in Hungary as well. That's why I put that here. It is this, this Japanese guy is a member of our archery group. Uh, he's an Ottoman historian and found these rare uh, inscripted rocks. This is from Scythian times, so it's earlier than the Turkic times. And this is a common culture, as I told you. They had the same religious beliefs. They have the same. Uh, lifestyle, they had the same tools to, to survive in this very um, uh, harsh uh, condition and uh, geography. And here you see there are steps and only steps and the sky. So it is not surprising that they had the uh, the Köktengri, as we call it in Turkish, or the uh, god of sky. They are not maybe gods, but they are deities, as 
uh, it should be uh, called in an animist belief. So the uh, the chief deity of this pantheon was the uh, the the Tengri or Kirk Tengri, god of sky, which is quite important because in this culture the birds are considered to be the messengers between the uh, sky and the people underneath. So this is important in the hunting culture just because. Uh, both the practical use of the birds of prey as well as the symbolic meaning of that um, remained after centuries. Uh, so we will see that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of aspects of this culture remained even after uh, these nations, including Hungarians, adopted new religions. But uh, many customs uh, remained or survived. As you can see, this is a cliche or a stereotype. Uh, uh, cavalry or a mounted archer shooting backwards which is which is called a parthian shot and as you see it is one of the aspects that have been remained as a, as a, uh, a weapon of war and a weapon of hunt uh, after centuries and after many changes in the geographical uh, uh, location in the religion and in lifestyle and everything and uh, uh, there are a lot of turkic dynasties who ruled this land after 9th century, and among them, the most important ones uh, could be considered as Selçuks, uh, Ottomans, Mughals, uh, and uh, uh, Memluks, because they are very much related uh, to the Turkic culture in terms of the tools they use, the cultural tools they use, and the, the sources that we have about them. And the, uh, I said that, that many aspects remained. Uh, one of these aspects is the, uh, the symbolic or political symbolic meaning of the weapons. Uh, the bow and arrow have been uh, used as a symbolic item in the hands of the sultans even after centuries because bow and arrow were symbols of these alliances because the warlords sent arrows to the other tribes to actually call them for building an alliance. So. Uh, this has been maintained uh, on the right side. This is a 17th century portrait of Ot Ot Osman II. So, and it is not only symbolic uh, representation or depiction. They really have a bow and arrow in the hand, as reported by Ogier de Busbeck, the Habsburg envoy who visited Suleiman I in the 16th century. So he saw the Sultan, in fact, uh, holding the bow and arrow in the hand while accepting the. Uh, or welcoming the envoys in the palace. So m many customs remained, and this is another custom that remained, and which I find quite interesting. This is the tomb of Suleiman Pasha. He, he uh, would have been the Suleiman the first if he didn't die, but he died in a uh, hunting accident. Uh, this is the tomb of him, and he was the crown prince, was the son of Orhan, which is the second uh, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and here you see he was buried with his horse and this is the 14th century so I think it is familiar to you and this is a repre representation of a Hungarian tomb on the immigration uh, route of the Magyars to the Carpathian Basin and you see the burials with horses so even adopting Islam so it is nothing to do with the burial custom of Islam he was buried with his horse so it is similar in on this uh, on this gravestone in uh, a graveyard in Ahlat in the west of Van Lake in Turkey, you see the dragon depiction, which is also a symbol from the pagan times from this old religion. So, uh, additional to that, mummifying, for example, which is again nothing to do with uh, the uh, burial customs of Islam, but uh, in seven museums in Turkey there are mummified corpses from uh, both uh, Mongolian. Uh, rulers of Anatolia in 13th, 14th centuries, as well as from early uh, Turkic uh, warriors, I mean Turkish warriors, pre-Ottoman. Pre and here, uh, this is also how uh, the old custom uh, remained in uh, the Hungarian culture. You see uh, in this Kepes Kronika, uh, the Nagi Lajos with the warriors on the left side, you see the nomadic uh, clothing as, as well as the weapons and on the right side there's a very western way very European feudal warrior so the transition can be can also be seen in the Magyar uh, weapons from uh, uh, 11th to 16th century the uh, sabers for example the curved blades uh, were also maintained so it is 
I'm showing this because it was very, very same in uh, the Ottoman, in the Turkish culture, even after adopting Islam and even changing the geographical location and even changing everything, they maintained many customs, especially on weapons and the hunting techniques. Uh, of course, uh, some aspects did not survive. For example, it was not for nutrition anymore after, uh, because they switched to an agricultural uh, system, not a nomadic lifestyle anymore. So, but it has been kept as a military practice uh, to uh, enhance their fighting skills and to practice the coordination intra and inter uh, uh, tribal in the uh, early times. And then, of course, in, in, uh, between the troops or in the troops. And uh, of course, to check their logistic needs and to practice the logistics. So the hunting, big hunting parties have always been a practice of war uh, in practical point of view and uh, for uh, as, uh, as the preparation to a big campaign as well. And it was in the uh, earlier stages, it was a gathering of the tribes, but in the empire, it was not the gathering of the uh, tribes. So this, it, it did not survive. It, it, but it survived as a re recreational activity, as a stress reliever in both Selchuk's and uh, Ottomans. And it was also for keeping a finger on the pulse of the public, because in, in an empire, it was almost impossible for regular people to get, to, to get in touch with the sultan. But uh, big parties, in the big parties, the public uh, were also involved somehow. So they had the chance to be closer to the sultan and even to, uh, to, to uh, mention their opinions. Uh, and a rite of passage in adolescence al is also something that did not survive. We can see that uh, it is a Mongolian custom, but the, the, the verb yalamaji, uh, the, the action, is Turkish. So it is a Turco-Mongol tradition, uh, most probably uh, existed in Turkish culture as well. So the weaponry also changed. Some of them have been kept and some of them uh, have not been kept. Of course, th during the development of the weapons, uh, towards the firearms, many things changed, but even in the in 17th century, long after the firearms have been adopted and uh, were common or even dominated the battlefield, the bow and arrow were in use in uh, hunting uh, for recreational purposes. Here you can see the bow and the horse, of course, like it was in the nomadic past, uh, was used uh, widely. This, this, these two depictions are from the Suleiman the first, 16th century in hunting, you can see uh, all the, uh, or many of the tools used here, a saber, a bow, and a horse, of course. But, and here in a Mughal uh, miniature, showing the Parthian shot that you've seen before here in the lecture. Uh, and the, the, after centuries, it has been kept, and the animals also have been sh uh, shot that way, just as a practice of uh, using the bow and arrow this way, uh, as a rehearsal of the war. But of course, it is a cliche that the, the bow and horse is an uh, uh, inseparable couple. It was not. In case it, it's needed, they dismounted, as you can see here uh, in another Ottoman miniature. And uh, the bow, the stereotype, as a stereotype, was uh, also not the only weapon they used as you saw uh, a hunter that was using a saber in hunting. And here there is a a uh, mace that was thrown at the head of a, a, a predator. And here you see another Ottoman uh, miniature from the Murad the first on the left side and the other Murad on the right side. Uh, the, this is the Sultan and the other one is a more humble one. And But the, the weapon that I h hold in my hand is interesting. It's called Rungu, a Masai uh, war stick. So you see that the design is almost the same. So uh, despite the differences in geography, uh, the culture and everything, so they both use these kind of weapons in hunting. And again, a dismounted archer running uh, or following, chasing a game, and uh, you, the, the use of the bow that way is a very uh, rare, and uh, in, fa in fact, in depictions, it's rare, and uh, worth to mention, I think. And uh, this is an accessory that I would like to uh, mention as an archer because th this is something we're practicing and we're uh, uh, experimenting. This is called Mejra in Arabic language and Navek in Persian. And it's, uh, there's a, an evidence from the Mughal miniatures that it also was used in hunting. In hunting, heavier arrows are preferred. So this arrow is shorter, which is shot through a tube. So it is probably, again, a rehearsal, a practice, uh, 
for for uh, for um, uh, experimenting the weapon or for mastering the weapon that they would use in the in the battlefield. Okay, this is uh, which I will pass. Uh, this is a hunting technique which was mentioned in Babur Name, the uh, autobiography of Babur Shah, the founder of the uh, Mughal uh, Empire. Uh, because of the lack of time, I have to uh, go a little bit fast. Okay, the use of beasts of prey is quite important, maybe much important than using the weapons. Uh, the bow and arrow has uh, have always been uh, a weapon that have been used for centuries but an arrow was a very expensive ammunition and it is uh, reported by the Arabian travelers in 9th century for example li like El Jahiz and Ibn, Ibn Fadlan they said that the Turkish uh, hunters could shoot birds uh, from on a horseback so they were so accurate in using the bow but still uh, because of the uh, the uh, probability of sh of hitting a bird in the hair on wings I mean from on horseback, it was uh, difficult. So they used beasts of prey, uh, dogs, uh, medium-sized cats, and uh, uh, dogs, dogs and birds, birds of prey. And here, uh, you can see a very good depiction that a falconer on the left side, which is the sultan himself, actually, and the uh, greyhounds attacking a deer. And on the left side bottom, you can see a saber again, and here, this is quite interesting, that a laszlo is also used because of the nomadic past. Probably this is a tool, or it was a tool, that they used in herding. In the empire, there's no herding anymore. It's an agricultural um, uh, system, and especially these kind of depictions are cortal hunting, mm -hmm. because we don't have uh, much evidence about how public hunted. So all we know, uh, from written sources as well as the depictions, is how the court or the palace, the court of people hunted. So it is a, a weapon uh, that remained actually from the nomadic times, from the herders. And uh, these beasts of prey uh, were greyhounds. They, they were two types classified in the old Ottoman sources, Taze and Zar. Uh, it's agar in uh, Hungarian, and it's a, it's a very uh, famous Hungarian agar as well, as a, as a bread. Uh, and the uh, catch dogs, they were bigger dogs. They are not fast like the greyhounds. They're, they're uh, more aggressive, bigger, and they were fed for bear hunting as well as war dogs. So using the dogs in the battlefield is not new. Uh, it was used in the ancient Greek uh, culture as well as in the Roman culture. But uh, the Ottomans uh, used that as well. And these dogs, you will see, uh, were, uh, uh, had the origin uh, of Transil uh, Transilvania, Valencia, and uh, Moldova. And the wildcats, the medium-sized wildcats like uh, leopards and uh, cheetah, as well as cats, have been used. But you may find it interesting. This is here in, in the uh, Hungarian National Museum. You see uh, the little cat just uh, uh, back on the horse. It is thought that it is n not a proof that these smaller cats have been used by the early Hungarians in hunting. Uh, uh, it is probably uh, the influence of, the, uh, of an Iranian school of art. But the cats, medium-sized or smaller cats, have been used by nomadic people, whether they were uh, speaking Indo-European uh, languages or other ling languages, Finno-Ugar or uh, ural Altaic. So this is one of these uh, those catch dogs. They're called Samson or Saxon, originated from uh, Mol uh, Moldova and, uh, and uh, Wallachia. And uh, there was uh, a military elite in the military bureaucracy who was uh, in charge with uh, feeding and training these dogs. Uh, who were, as I said before, used in uh, the battlefield. And this is another very good depiction, which uh, covers almost all the techniques and the beasts of prey and, uh, and uh, anything they, they used in hunting. Uh, uh, sh archer, two archers, actually. One of them is shooting backwards, the Parthian shot, uh, and uh, a saber on the right, and uh, a cheetah and a greyhound. It's a quite a good uh, depiction which covers almost all the techniques. Uh, birds of prey is Suleiman I hunting with a birds of prey. Had another important uh, part in the Turkish hunting culture because hunting and the military uh, institution 
uh, were inseparable from each other. And this Doancı, which uh, is falconer in English, was one of the high rank military officers in the palace and uh, in the uh, provinces. And th these uh, hunting troops, they were, well, I have to explain first what Enderun is. You see it on the in the title. Enderun is the inner side of the palace in Istanbul. And uh, these are the officers who were close to the Sultan, uh, almost friends. Of course not, because uh, from a technical point of view, all the military bureaucracy consisted of slaves, actually. This is very interesting, because slavery in the Eastern world is completely different than the slavery in the Western world. But technically, they were slaves. But they were educated in the, at the same place with the Sultan, so they were close and reliable. Okay. Uh, anyway, these uh, bird, uh, the, the trainers of these birds of prey uh, were also the, the uh, high rank military officers. In Enderun, or in the uh, inner uh, part of the palace, there was a falconer, the, the chamber of falconers, maybe it can be called that. And Hani Bazian is the uh, Persian word. And they were called Shikar Alar. And they were uh, different types of uh, falconers because. In uh, Turkish language, we can simply put this j at the end, like you, you do, for example, galambas, modaras, it's the same. But in English, you can't. Instead of falconer, you can't say hawker, because hawker means something else. So even if it's not maybe uh, exactly correct, you can imagine shahin jibashi, atmaca jibashi, different types of birds of prey, and as, okay, modaras in general. So, uh, and uh, in Birun, or outside of the palace, there is another uh, part of this, uh, these, these hunting troops, uh, elite hunters in the military bureaucracy. And they are, uh, they are the trainers of uh, birds of prey and dogs. This Sekban Bashi, for example, Sekban is a Persian word which means the dog feeder. Zar is, I, as I told before, is a greyhound. And uh, Samson Jubash, again, these uh, big uh, dogs that were uh, used in battlefields. And there, were, there was another part of the military bureaucracy in the provinces of the Ottoman Empire. So they were uh, assigned with the uh, written order of the Sultan. And uh, uh, they, uh, they actually had to send falcons and the other birds of prey in return of exempt of tax. So uh, they, uh, they didn't pay the tax of, the, of their agricult agricultural income. Instead, they just uh, harvest, uh, trained, and sent to the palace these birds of prey. And these uh, provincial modaras uh, had some subspecializations. So there were some modaras who harvest the young birds, others trained them, others maybe uh, took them to the palace. Another interesting point is uh, the, uh, these birds of prey uh, have been a diplomatic gift as well as, as, well as uh, a, a sign of warning and threatening. Uh, in the Babur Name, as I told you, the autobiography of uh, Babur Shah, it's mentioned that a falcon was sent to one of the uh, neighboring kings who uh, invaded the Turkic land, so they warned them by sending a falcon uh, as a diplomatic sign. And this is also important. There, there were royal hunting lands, and this is an, a, an official official order of Suleiman the uh, First restricting the use of this land by public, especially after 16th century when the firearms were adopted by uh, uh, by civilians after the second half of the 16th century, after the, the Jelali uh, rebels. So uh, this land uh, sh should have been protected by the order of the Sultan. Mehmed I is a very important Sultan in terms of the uh, hunting culture in 16th, 17th thir uh, centuries. And it is also important in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Hungarian uh, history. Uh, he was the sultan who was obsessed with hunting. It was ju not just a recreational activity, he was really obsessed. And 
uh, he was going to Edirne, which was a very uh, popular hunting land of the time, uh, and also one of the former uh, capital cities. And he was going there for three months, four months, and then he really moved there. So he didn't come back to Istanbul. And it was, of course, a chaos in the state, in the, in the management, in the governing of the state. So uh, at that time, uh, Budin was lost by the Ottomans. And uh, uh, the Mohaj, there was a defeat of the Ottoman uh, Empire in, the, in Mohaj in uh, 1688. 1688, right? I think so. 1688, so 17th century, second half of 17th century. So it was the reason that he was decrowned, or that the crown has been taken from Mehmet IV, which is also called Avji Mehmet, uh, Mehmet the Hunter. And uh, the last milestones in Ottoman hunting were these uh, Mehmed IV, uh, who regret actually because of his interest in hunting, Mustafa II, who was the last hunting sultan, as far as we know, who was, who was the son of Mehmed IV, and the, the abolishment of the Janissary army, which uh, was also uh, an important part of the hunting troops in Birun, out of the palace. And in Tanzimat reforms in uh, 19th century, the end of the Madara system came. So the, the Madara system uh, was abolished after 1839. Uh, this is another uh, very interesting miniature. I just want you to see it. This is Suleiman I, probably demonstrating the uh, princess uh, how to kill an animal, maybe or how to shoot a bow. Because it is, as you see, there, there's, it's not a hunting scene. There, there's a fence over there. He's probably teaching something. So thank you very much for being patient. And I really thank to these persons here uh, for their help to prepare this lecture and for uh, being here. Thank you.